Welcome, and thanks for joining me today on Mortgage Manager Playbook, a podcast for sales leaders who want to improve their team's sales performance and originate more loans. I'm Pat Sherlock, your host. Today's topic I'm very excited about because I'm passionate about this topic, and that's good sales leadership is a sales multiplier. And I'm thrilled to have Mark Dates with us today to talk about this important topic. Mark is Managing Director at State Employees Credit Union. He's the head of retail, wholesale, and home equity. He has a lot on his plate for sure. Uh, previous to that, Mark had a successful career within mortgage banking at Academy, Purse Savings, and other firms. And so he's also active within our industry and is president of the Maryland uh, Mortgage Bankers, in addition to being a CMB. Hi, Mark. Hi, Pat. Thanks for having me. Well, this is one of my favorite topics for sure. And I do want to talk first about, about how did you get into the world of mortgage lending? Well, like so many others, there's no clear path or a, uh, a degree that you earn in a, any college or university. But for mortgage banking, I was a policeman for four years on my path to become a federal law enforcement agent with Secret Service. Went through that process right at, at uh, the time of 9-11 and the reformation from the Treasury Department to Homeland Security. And the, it was quite a lengthy process. And during that 13 months, we found out on the tail end that we were expecting our oldest child now who's finishing up college and uh, had to decide if shift work and travel was going to be good for a, a newly formed uh, family. So what I ended up doing was leaning into some of you know our peer relationships here in the Washington metro area, one of which was a good friend of mine who just passed away last year, Chris Warner sort of the godfather of mortgage banking in D.C. And he took a chance on me and, and invested time in me to teach me the business during the hours and the days that I had to use as as leave when I was a policeman. And through osmosis and some goodwill and eagerness, I jumped into the business in 2002. Well, your story is similar to a lot of them, but that's really a very interesting one for sure. So talk about you obviously have a lot on your plate. Some of the challenges that you have in your current position. Yeah, this is this this one's interesting because I think it does ebb and flow. The, this past year has been quite a challenge for the industry, as we all know, with uh, you know the doubling of rates and limited inventory, and you know, just a lot of prospective home buyers uh, sitting on the sidelines. You know, for us and, and obviously the shrinkage in our industry as it relates to originators, and so. You know, my task last year really became very clear was to look for opportunities to create opportunities for our mortgage loan officers and our entire team while keeping them motivated and on task. Their their biggest challenge was to, to continue to be excited about being in the business as they were and continue to be the survivors, if you will. And so, you know, ultimately it's it's making sure that we're supporting our team and and you know whether it's through lead generation or investing in them from a resource standpoint and education but also just you know continuing to be a source of encouragement and uh you know really cheerlead their efforts to keep them motivated in, in the game so that that really to me was the biggest challenge is to kind of reform our day-to-day -day management of our team to you know really become more of uh coaches and leaders um, through difficult time well, that certainly has been a challenge for really everybody. And so no surprise, it was a top priority for you. Talk about, Mark, from the standpoint of what issues do you think mortgage bankers should be addressing that are not addressing? You know, it, it, it ultimately, as we've shifted, uh, we enjoyed a, a few really good years in the refinance time, you know, leading up to 2000. 22 or 21 and you know really kind of retraining our our brains to become purchase oriented loan officers and the challenge for us is to get to the potential buyers our end borrowers or members in the credit union space you know prior to them committing to um, some of our competition so we're really taking the time as it might have been a little bit of downtime last year to look at our you know mlo's process and prospecting um, approach to how do I, you know, not only retain my existing book of business and continue to cultivate relationships within that sphere of influence, but also look outside of that and how do I attract new opportunities and, and you know, what does that look like? A lot of MLOs had done that in some time. So really just going through a methodical process of, you know, teaching them how to prospect again 
and uh, develop new relationships while at the same time helping them look at from the beginning to the end their their process of how they engage a borrower right at the first conversation to when they hand off a borrower to a processor or an underwriter or closer and when they get to the finish line and after that as well so really working on you know supporting the MLO prospecting efforts and you know really looking at the most efficient and effective way that makes it the easiest for borrowers to engage with us and accomplish their goals. Well, that's my second favorite topic, prospecting. So I'm glad that you emphasize that because I do see your, the issue every day. So and not, not enough prospecting is being done. And that leads into some of the priorities that you have for this year. What, what are a couple of them that you, you are wanting to emphasize? You know, I think when we when we look at it, I refer to the pie shrinking, it's the population of law officers is shrinking. We're, we're aging as well in general. And I, I think the mindset has consistently been, if we look to grow our sales team, it, that's a good thing. And how do we do that? It's to, you know, pay a top producing MLO uh, somewhere else a good bit of money to come over and, you know, if it's a credit union, leverage our balance sheet, our product and pricing set, you know, strategies. You know, to me, it's actually rethinking how we retain our existing talent. And if we're going to hire someone from the outside, it's actually rethinking how we, what talents we look for. I, I don't necessarily think just the mere fact that somebody had a, a large book of business, that's the right decision because they're really good, you know, MLO in our culture. I think it starts with, and you and I had had previous conversation about this, it's mm-hmm. this mind shift change where, you know, I think it, it starts with the hiring practice. It's it's looking for talent, just like me, as I shared my example. You know, I didn't fit the traditional mold of who could be a successful mortgage loan officer. I saw some success, but it was because I desired that. So when you go back to it, it's you know, there's there's some recipe, you know, of success that can be had by hiring the right people who have the personal motivation to learn that aren't stubborn. If somebody comes to you with a an existing book of business, they probably already have some habits that you can't break and they right. probably are not going to grow beyond what their existing success right. has shown them. So it's really when I think about what we need to be doing this year, it's investing in our folks, creating opportunities for them, supporting them and encouraging them along the way. Is there any other priorities that you might have also? Because I think obviously they're the key ones, but anything else that's important to you in 2024? Yeah, it's it certainly to continue to, to, for us, we have a pretty ha- healthy balance sheet. So working with our vendor partners to really look at how we have the right product offerings for our referral partners, whether that's real estate agents who have the need for lower down payment options or, you know, builders in the marketplace who are concerned about, you know, the eight to 12 months that it may take to build a home. Are they going to make a profit? Are their buyers going to qualify? at the mm-hmm. point in time with some of the uncertainty around interest rates and quali- qualifying you know it's mm-hmm. just it's really just communicating and making sure that we position our balance sheet our product offering around what will be mm-hmm. make a meaningful difference for home ownership whether it's the two million dollar home or it's the two hundred thousand dollar home with low moderate income is a priority for us making sure that we're serving underserved communities so just really looking at our business from the 30,000 foot level and not from the, you know, the ground level. No, that's a good point for sure. And I think that's a good segue into our main topic today to talk about good sales leadership as a sales multiplier. And of course, you and I have both been in the business for a while. And certainly it seems like we overemphasize production versus managing. Talk about your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's uh, it's near and dear to my heart. I mean, you know, somebody had offered me the opportunity, by, you know, by opening the door in the past for me. And oh, I was smart enough to walk through, I consistently say. And and it, so when I think about the, the ideas of mentorship and fellowship, it's it, it touches many of these aspects of what I think makes a quality sales manager. And, and what I really get into is we've got to bring people along with us. And as I mentioned before, you know, our industry's sort of aging in place, if you will. Um, to use sort of a metaphor for what our, you know, that real estate market is experience as well. But sure. it ultimately comes down to investing in the right people, getting involved in our industry and, you know, continuing to challenge each other, you know, to, to continue to learn. And 
what might have worked in the past doesn't always work in the future. To your point, just hiring a top producer just costs you a lot of money. You know, right. what comes with hiring a top producer isn't always what's best for the organization. So, you know, can we look at things a little bit differently, hire the right people, provide opportunities for those folks who may have had some success, a taste of success, but have, checks all the boxes with personality and personal right. motivation and is flexible and has the desire to achieve success. And if we look at those folks and invest in those people and mentor those people, they become fantastic leaders in our industry. And I think too often we're so enamored with the, the, the shiny object syndrome, which is going after top performers. And I think there's so much opportunity outside of our industry, even just to identify people who have that other recipe, which is personality. I mean, you can teach anybody how to put together a 1003, especially with technology today, right? But do they have the personality that would add value to your culture and what you're trying to accomplish? So, Mark, talk about your thoughts, and, and this really uh, segues into what I just mentioned, that the industry has moved towards not really a lot of development at the management level. And it's moved towards, if anything, more emphasis on the production, the product side, the technology side. And talk about your thoughts on the difference that a good manager makes. You know, I, I think there's there's a lot of pictures that I've seen that describe uh, really good sales leadership. And um, it, it's really, to me, it's empathy and not sympathy. It's rolling up your sleeves and being willing to prioritize others before yourself. and you know, it's it's this mindset, a lot of what, you know, in the past, my mindset had could have been described as servant leadership. You mm -hmm. know, if if you're looking to succeed as a, a leader, a sales leader, you know, you, you've got to be willing to see other success um, first. You know, in, in the past, I mean, you know, we, we've probably all seen this before where the top performer at, at, an, at an organization was the one who got promoted to manager. And they were producing yeah. managers and their production, you know, on occasion would outperform your production. And you spited that a little bit. And and so that that's sort of the opposite of what I'm describing in that servant leadership role is, you know what, if if I don't achieve this level of success because your success comes before mine, you know, to me, that's the, the prototypical um, servant leader. So I think at the end of the day, you know, really investing in people and rolling up your sleeves and making sure that others' interests come before yours is is what my mindset would be to be a successful sales leader. And so I do hear, I have heard it more recently, and I have not heard it in the past, where people are questioning the producing sales manager structure, which is obviously common at most lenders. And at one point, I didn't think they would ever change, <laughs> but it does seem I am hearing lenders say that. What are your thoughts on that? I can go both ways on it. I, I think there's a middle ground to be had. You know, one aspect, I think you can have a true appreciation from, quote, you know, say the, the, the quote unquote front lines. If you do originate some business, you know, that may not be distracting. So there may be producing manager makes sense for me because you can appreciate the discussions and you can mentor others about discussions about, you know, rate objections or you know, appraisal came in low and, you know, how to have those conversations kind of keeps you in the game and in the current mindset of the loan officer teams that you're supporting. But on the other hand, what's too much, right? So again, back to my conversation about, or our conversation about your pipeline may exceed, you know, some of those you're supposed to be supporting. That's a conflict. And putting your interests above others is, is certainly a conflict. So I could Certainly see the three iterations. One, your sales manager is a producing manager. They're the top performer. They're the, 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 they're, they're the one that stands out at the top of the hill. There's the other polar opposite, which is a non-producing manager whose only interest is to see you succeed, but may not be as in tune with those difficult conversations or be a player coach, subject matter expert within a loan origination system and work out the bugs if you get stuck somewhere. Or maybe there's a middle ground where mm -hmm. there's a cap on production. They've got to do a couple of loans a month to keep them fresh and active and can provide value from that front seat perspective. So I think I'd probably land on the, the ladder where you've got you know, some yeah. production, but not enough to overwhelm or, or create any conflict. 
Well, one of the things, and I think you raised an interesting point, one of the things that I've seen over, and obviously the producing manager structure is popular because it's the idea is, is that the expenses are being handled by at the local level and the producer who has enough revenue is going to obviously be able to absorb it. But I also see companies trying to emphasize growth and under that model, uh, it really is not an incentive for the, the producing manager because they're majority of the production to actually you know, emphasize some other about actually growing. Certainly there are managers that do, but it does seem like it's a false, it's a false concept that we want growth and the recruiting has to be done at that level. That person's also the manager, that person's also the producer, and we're doing this to certainly kind of put a capture on our expenses. So it does seem like it goes in circles. It's really difficult for growth to happen. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and it, it, very good point. And I think it, it's not a one size fits all answer mm-hmm. too, right? It depends on what type of organization you are. If, if you're a smaller independent mortgage company and you, you, you need the revenue, you know, you certainly sure. probably do have to produce, right? You know, if you're a larger institution and, you know, that manager, is responsible as well for, you know, let's say a PL and um, or some operations decisions or things like that. You know, not being a producing manager could could one be a could, could be a compliance requirement, um, but two, it, it could make sense because they're focused on just running the business as opposed to you know sort of working on the business as opposed to in the business. So. I guess it ultimately depends on what the goals are of the organization. Again, I, I do think, you know, I get back to it just because I, I know this from my seat. I've kind of done, you know, all three iterations of this. I think the most value that I've seen, um, you know, is having that limit on production where you still, you know, you're in the, you know, you're in your loan origination system. You're engaging with some level of referral partners and you can appreciate what a day-to-day mortgage loan officer may have to deal with. So. You know, again, I don't think it's a one size fits all. It's probably dependent on what your what your goals are as the organization you work with. Yeah, I think that's a really good point for sure. But I also am curious, and I know when I talked with you previously, you talked about how you developed yourself from a managing standpoint because you went from production to uh, managing, and certainly it's a whole different game. What are some of your thoughts on how to develop these individuals to become better managers? Because it sorely is needed within our industry. Yeah, uh, this is really where I'm passionate. You know, I, I mm-hmm. certainly leveraging folks like yourself who are really good resources to help develop leaders. I take the mentality personally of being an, an, a constant learner, not thinking ever that I'm satisfied having known what I know. That's all I'm going to know kind of philosophy. Sure. So mm-hmm. for me, you know, one example for personally was you know, making a conscious decision to achieve my certified mortgage banking designation, you know, at at that point in most people's career, they don't want to be bothered with, you know, the designation or the task of having to learn a whole, you know, certainly some become second nature, but, you know, to take a test at the age of whatever and uh, have to do an oral panel is probably not appealing to most, but it, it, it just, you know, to invest in myself is important because then I feel like I'm, I'm continuously learning and able to transfer that knowledge to those who I may have an opportunity to impact. But it also goes beyond that, you know, so you talk about peer networking and you can certainly spend a lot of money on coaching and right. become a, becoming a better mortgage loan officer or, or manager or leader in whatever capacity, but you could also lean on a lot of your peers and just make relationships through, in my case, you know, being active with the Mortgage Bankers Association locally here in Metro Washington. So it, it's given me the opportunity to meet new folks. They, while you may share a lot of the same issues and have to manage um, similar, um, through similar concerns, you know, they're different perspectives. So peers throughout the industry is an important thing. And that to me comes from the fellowship that you get by being active within the associations that are a lot more local to you. Well, you've raised a really a fabulous point. And if you could talk more about being active in the local groups, because certainly I've been involved with a lot of the local groups across the country. They don't seem to get the support. And they also, I don't know that lenders think uh, that it's that important to belong to anymore. What, what are you seeing? Yeah, you know, especially in markets like uh, we, we are currently in, have been in for 18 months, let's say now, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a couple fold. It's well, I certainly talked about the fellowship. So you're you're meeting like minded people who could positively impact your mm -hmm. uh, perspective on the industry. The second thing is education resources. You know whether it you know whether it's LO Comp today or it's you know some change in compliance tomorrow or as an example uh, artificial intelligence how this may be used to you know benefit the industry. What are the pitfalls that you may not be considering? Those are the types of things. And then the last thing I would mention is really more near and dear to my heart is legislative or advocacy. So issues come up that affect the way that we do business and lawmakers, whether we think it or not, you know, don't always have the context, you know, when they're putting a, uh, a bill into, you know, your state house or raising it on the federal level with the Congress, we can have an impact or a say and an opinion on some of the bills and the legislation that gets introduced locally and nationally. And collaborating with the National MBA, the local and national association of realtors is a really fulfilling, you know, concept. So, you know, we've had really positive impacts on one timely example of this credit trigger lead issue. Mm -hmm. So your your customer, your member, you know, in a, getting their having obtained their credit for the purpose of say pre-approval for the purchase of a home, they could be receiving upwards of 100, 200 text messages and calls as a result of their information uh, being sold to the highest bidder. That that doesn't feel right. You know, it's, it's become right. big business. And so, you know, we had the ability to uh, provide opinion and commentary. Um, and, you know, the representative from Tennessee introduced the bill to stop that unless you had a relationship and they lived that member consumer lived within your servicing portfolio you know that they halted or it's currently being introduced to the senate but you know that's an example of our ability to get involved and it's only it's only through membership with local state mortgage bankers association and your activity and your involvement with the mortgage action alliance where you can have your voice heard so if you want if you have an opinion about something that impacts your your industry your business and the way that you do the business you've got to be active and have a voice um, otherwise somebody else is going to have to toe that line so yeah i mean to me that's that's really the three-prong benefit of being active within the industry it's having a voice within legislative and advocacy it's the education opportunities and lastly, it's the networking and fellowship. Well, it's a terrific point that you're making. I really have to have you come back and talk about that specifically, because obviously there's not a lot of people, especially at the younger level, that seem to participate. So I do think it deserves another topic by itself. And so we only have a few minutes left today. Uh, time has flown by. Mark, any takeaways that you would like to have for our listeners? Yeah, again, I, I, I'm really passionate about uh, being this always learner, you know, mentality. And, and you know, so that that's investing in yourself. And, you know, that could be in the form of daily commentaries. You know, there's plenty of them out there. You know, read, 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 read industry publications. Be aware of what's happening in the markets. But again, you know, look for uh, if you're a manager, look for peer relationships. Get mm -hmm. active uh, with the local and state associations. And, you know, look to pull somebody forward with you, you know, be a mentor to somebody else. You know, somebody invested in me, as I described to you earlier in this interview, um, and I embrace that. And I look forward to opportunities to do the same with others who may be, you know, younger or just starting their managerial or leadership opportunities themselves. So, you know, it's all about what we give to others and feel fulfilled that, um, you know, we see their success and our success. Well, I can't agree with you more, and I certainly appreciate, Mark, sharing your wisdom today. And I want to thank our listeners for listening to our podcast today. And, and certainly, if you want to catch up on other podcasts, go to patsherlock.com. Anything else, uh, Mark, that you'd like to share? No, you know, better times ahead. And uh, Pat, I truly <laughs> appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. It was a pleasure. Well, you've been great. Thanks for listening to Mortgage Manager Playbook. You can catch up on all our episodes by subscribing to receive each week a new show. Don't forget to share this podcast with your friends and team members. If you're looking to increase production, call me to discuss my prospecting sales training program. 
ramping up realtor referral sources. Check out my website, www.patsherlock.com.